Welcome to XOR Episode 5, with our guest, Alex Brown, a product designer. Well, I would say my, I'm interested in everything. So I'm, I pick up or I have ambitions to do everything all the time. So, you know, this thing that we spoke about, the little brand that I've been working on for a while is one of many things. Like I started and stopped different design agencies. To be honest, I've never actually got anywhere with any of them. Um, that's fine. The right? one that's, the one that's continued was, was this brand and all it started from was, I've always liked design. It's similar to what I do in my in my field anyway, but what I really wanted to do was move away from just designing one thing because I've always been in automotive, always been designing cars. Obviously slightly different with what I'm doing now, but design is so transferable. You have a skill set that if you can design one thing, in theory, you can design everything. It's just your approach to it. And I love that idea. And that part of me thought, if that's the case, why am I just doing one thing? Why am I designing one element of, mm. or one product when I could in theory be doing everything? And that's where this, initially it came up with the idea of having an agency and a bit of money on the side. And where it took me to was looking at brands that do everything. And it also coincided at a time where collaborative design really picked up. So what I mean by collaborative design is brands that do different things. So it could be like a, a clothing brand and a car brand or uh, an, a, a, an artist and um, I don't know, an alcohol brand will combine and produce either a capsule or they'll release a range of things. What's a capsule? A capsule is like a, a limited release of clothing. All right. So it would be like a summer, a summer capsule will have like four or five different t-shirts or, you know, it's that sort of restricted, smaller scope item. Like a limited edition. Exactly, that sort of thing. Like, yeah, Dior would do one with like Hajime Sorayama and then exactly that. Arrival did one with uh, Louis Arrival, Vuitton. Arrival, Louis Vuitton, all of that sort of stuff I love. And it's come at a time where, in my opinion, what pioneered it was, was sneaker design. So that sort of hype, industry and the, the following that it has it gets a lot of hate and i do i can see why there's a bit of hate because it, it sort of people become a bit of a sheep and it, again it loses value when too many people look let's say the supreme supreme came under a lot of scrutiny because everyone would go and buy supreme without sort of understanding what what it was that people were interested in at the start it was just a case of everyone is buying Supreme, I'm gonna mm. buy Supreme now. Where in actual fact, you know, and for example, Travis Scott has done it very well. His collaborations with Nike or like Adidas with, with uh, Yeezy and, you know, all of that has kept come at the right time. And effectively, the reason I like the collaboration is because you have two different approaches. So you have two brands and by brand, I mean, it's, it's the way they think, it's the people they have, it's their, their design language in this case, come together to produce something that they couldn't have done on their own. It mm. requires both sides to actually produce something amazing. And I think at the time, you know, for example, like a rival Louis Vuitton, it's, that's, that's just a limited edition product. But what I think is amazing about it is that you have a very successful product in the Louis Vuitton trunk. You know, it's like a staple of furniture and, and also fashion combined with the new manufacturing technique, the PPGF, all of that, they'd never be able to do that on their own. Right, yeah. And you know, that for me was like, if that's the case, one of the ideas I had was creating this industry that was just for collabor collaborative design. And that's where I think it was called concept, concept with an X and the X would be, I don't know if you've seen on, on the collaboration logos, you'll have like, Louis Vuitton X arrival yeah, yeah. or like um, and it's and what's happened now is because it's grown the the scope of people getting involved is grown as well so you get like you know the reggaeton market you have like Jay Balvin and Bad Bunny collaborating with major brands to release mm. ranges of clothing that's amazing you know these guys they don't know like they, they didn't grow up learning how to design from that's what I know but well, that's my, my viewpoint. But you end up with a product that, again, like Adidas wouldn't have been able to come up with before. You need the input from other people. And so, yeah, that's, that's where part of my interest came in. And then I thought, 
if that's the case, why don't we try and do it at a smaller scale and look at what at the time was what collaborations would look like if I was doing them. So I would sort of step in the in the shoes of um, one of them that I did was like let's say Lego and um, well Lego and IKEA did one for example that was one that I would thought about a couple of years before. Oh, you you um, predicted the collab. Yeah, I predicted. It. <laughs> um, well, I mean, certain, certain brands are like. You should check your uh, phone. Um, yeah, the- I'm under, but. Um, Certain brands are like made to be together as well. Well, yeah, both of them put pieces together, right? Well, exactly. That makes sense. Exactly. And they do it very cheaply. And uh, aren't they both, I think, isn't it Norwegian for Lego and Swedish for IKEA? Yeah, so, you know, Scandinavian yeah. roots. And again, similar, like, similar approaches is, to is designs. It Norwegian or Danish? I don't know about Lego. I think I think it's Danish. I don't know. Yeah, yeah maybe Danish, actually. I don't know. But, <laughs> we'll check that one later. And for, I don't know if I showed you, I did like a, a croc um, with a Nike. Right. It was like a croc, effectively, <laughs> it, and this this sort of comes on to one of the main points of this this brand that I was trying to create was um, trying to reuse what we already have. So w- one of the main selling points, or one of the things I was looking at with my brand, so the brand was called Colpio, which is Culture Pioneer. That was the the split, and Culture Pioneers are effectively like a level above influencers who are sort of the underground guys who will be defining what what's next in fashion in art in you know music in design you would like scout for them and well no this is the that's the sort of uh what's the word the legend behind them these these people are the the real influencers but they're not necessarily the ones that that see the limelight Mm -hmm. and i quite like that idea um so i looked at what what it would be to be a culture pioneer and whether I could apply it to the brand. So it actually took me a couple of years to define what my brand was or even, you know, it took me two years to design a logo. I thought starting a brand, the most important thing is a logo. It's absolutely not. Like, you know, Nike, for example, the logo is probably the most iconic logo ever, the, the tick. And when I see that, my 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 thoughts or what I think about Nike is is very clearly um, sort of I can visualize it very clearly because of the strength of the brand backed up by the logo. Where in actual fact, the reason it's so good is because the brand Nike is amazing. There are so many levels to it; it's so deep rooted, and I sort of lost lost sight of that. And one thing that actually picked it up for me was the Travis Scott logo or his I'm talking a lot about Travis Scott I'm actually not a big fan but uh, <laughs> it's too late now yeah, yeah. It's, it's he, 12 minutes of he, Travis Scott he's got um, he's got a Cactus Jack brand and the logo is like a squiggle of, of his name mm. and it like it's a terrible logo but it does so well and the reason it does well is not because of the logo it's because of who he is like mm. it's his following and that sort of changed my my perspective almost overnight and Actually, the next day I, I came down and, and I, I basically used to, my room had a bed. It was one room, but it had like a um, a mezzanine bed at the top. Mm-hmm. So I had like a workspace at the bottom and then a bed at the top. And I used to have a blank piece of paper on my desk every single morning that I'd go down and either come up with an idea for something or what usually was, I'd sketch a logo before I went to work to see if it was what I wanted. It's like a flip a coin every day. Yeah, sort of thing. Because also, like, I have my, I have quite an active mind. So I always, I'll always go to bed and and think, oh my God, like, that would be a cool product to go into. And that's where part of my, my thirst for doing other things or being interested in everything comes from the fact that my mind is so active when it comes to design or um, new ideas or like even just thinking in general why things are a certain way why what it would take to solve them you know that sort of process is quite difficult for me to shut off and I found that the paper was at least I could sort of compartmentalize if I do that for five minutes before I go to work that's that sort of feeds the urge for a bit and I, and I came down straight from bed and I was like, do you know what? The logo doesn't even have to be good. And I squiggled a face. I was like, yeah, look, if my brand was strong enough, a little face would be ideal. And then the more I started thinking about it, I like got ready to go to work and I left, came back in. I was like, actually, this is it. This is 100% <laughs> it. And 
I then f- realized that I could turn the, the, the letters in the, the, the face, sorry, so the nose, the eyes, the ears and the mouth into the letters Colpio. So the logo itself is a yeah, face see, made out of the letters. Like the first C is the ear, right? Exactly. Okay. And then the U is the mouth, the L is the nose. And that all came from like a change of mindset, change of attitude. And that's what collaborative design brings in. Like if, if you if you have the same people working on the same thing, same design language, same design approach, you are going to get the same product or slight variations of it, but in, in essence, the same project and product over the same 10 to 20 years. As soon as you start injecting different influences or different brands or different ways of thinking, that's where it becomes interesting. And that's where I, again, I think to the level now, it's probably started to oversaturate collaborative design because everyone wants to jump on it and now you, it's almost impossible to not buy something that has a collaboration Mm-mm. you know like you can't go buy a North Face jacket it's now North Face and Supreme or North Face and um, and Bape or whatever you know it, it's to that level now and it's almost seen that the, the norm is you know it's, it's now uncool to buy what was previously a cool jacket because it's not a collaboration so with everything there's that you need to mediate it you need that balance but I can definitely see that. I can definitely... I've bought a couple of things. I mean, I bought a... You know, I think it was Moleskine and Game of Thrones or right. something that was like... I think I like... I I would definitely buy like Dr. Martens with some collabs. Like, I think I would um, subconsciously prefer collabs. There, there's something... I, I agree. There's I mean, something th- in there like that I want. Maybe b- the clout of both brands at the same time. Maybe it's, it's like double... It, it's double cool double yeah. cool well that's the thing and and as i said before like i'm it's probably sounds hypocritical because I, I i buy i love these things like these things are amazing i love collecting different brands you know there was one with skepta and um and a rum i can't remember what it was but i was like that that blew my mind you know and what what i loved about it is skepta probably never thought he was going <laughs> to be designing a, a range of alcohol do you know what i mean and that that's what it enabled you to do or him to do and I love that idea and I love the idea of waking up and being able to do something new every day partly because I love that variety and I I'm interested in everything walk me through um, how you became that person that thinks that way for example it's a good question I um, I've tried to design a couple of logos myself and I realized I'm not that person like um, I tried obviously not for two years like I tried for a bit (laughs) and I just realized like you look at just design in general um, I think you guys are different mindsets and you need those different think different types of thinkers and I realized man this is like mentally exhausting for me to try to like cr- turn letters into like pictures yeah. and manipulate like I don't know like edge of a letter into some other thing that it's not like I see like being <laughs> an engineer I'm very logical yeah and it's like how did, did you first of all did you as a kid realize that I am that guy like I am I think that way <laughs> I'm that guy it, that's a good question but funny enough again like my it, it's a bit hypocritical because I grew up knowing I wanted to be a product designer like obviously I still want to be a footballer so don't get me <laughs> wrong but um, I always loved it and partly like my family are creative so that they you know, my dad is an architect. My mum was an architect in Brazil, came over. My little brother's an architect. My older brother's an artist. You know, that oh, wow, okay. we're, it's that sort of family. That's and we were always encouraged to do stuff as well. Like, it's amazing upbringing. And I went, I went to a fantastic school as well, but it wasn't that sort of place. And partly to do with my personality, I'm really bad at organising. I'm, I'm late to everything. I'll leave everything last minute. And I left my uni choice right to the end. And the whole time I was like, yeah, I'm just going to do product design. I'm just going to do product design or industrial design or, you know, along the lines. And then about a week before I had to apply, I asked my school, like, what do you think I should do? And I think at the time you needed, you needed a portfolio and like three C's or something to get into a few of these design schools. And my school were like, don't do that do engineering you know you're doing the subjects anyway and then you can specialize in design so I was like yeah cool (laughs) applied did engineering you know I didn't even read what mechanical engineering was before I did it I didn't visit any other unis as well Um, 
I knew I wanted to go to uni to do sport. I was doing sport at the time as well. Um, and I went to Bath and Bath was amazing for the sport I was doing. It was right up there as well with engineering and my older brother was there. So I was like, I don't need to visit it, I'll go there. And what it turned out was I really didn't enjoy my time at uni in terms of the subject I was in because it was effectively a maths course and I, I really didn't like maths. I wasn't particularly good at it as well. And there was a tiny element of design and even within that, it was like, you know, you were calculating what gears to use or what springs or what chains to buy. I wanted to be designing the aesthetic side of it. I've always had like that, that eye for aesthetics and appreciation. Um, and I basically spent my whole time since trying to move away from engineering because I'm a qualified engineer and that actually reflects negatively, in my opinion, on if you, if you were to move into design. So I spent months after uni applying to become a designer everywhere, all around the world. And the way I did it, I uploaded my portfolio onto um, a website and then uploaded the website so I could track the views and almost none of them would give it the time of day. And the reason for it when I asked for feedback was, oh, you're an engineer, you know, you're yeah. too logical. Um, and there were all those cult stories that Apple used to only hire people under 30 because they were the dreamers, you know. And I can see, obviously, like everything needs a balance. You need the realistic aspects and you need the designers to challenge what, what we can achieve. But in my opinion, I always struggle to find my, my, my place within, especially at uni, like, I used to spend more time editing how my report would look and try and improve the visuals as opposed to the content. And, you know, sometimes it worked really well, sometimes it didn't. It, depend, it depends on who, who receives it or, or who values what. But that, again, that side of me is, I've continued my whole time throughout work. and. I thought what, you know, what's, what's, there's nothing better than being able to do that full time in my own thing. But I didn't want to take that risk at this point in my life. I want an easy life. I want to enjoy my life. But I thought jumping into my own business off nothing is too much. So back to your question. I, yeah, I think I always knew, like I always loved design. Mm. I always loved the idea of creating stuff designing stuff and like more more so recently being able to actually physically see tangible things that I've designed or like design clothes that I wear like I wore stuff that I designed and made yesterday to work mm. like that is such a cool feeling right yeah um, I think my question was also I mean I guess it comes short because you weren't uh, taught um, product design as much to answer that question like I would ask you how, yeah. how do you Like if you're not born with it, like how can you take someone like me and make me think like a product designer? Like what would that take? Do it's you think it's question. possible? Um, I think everything's possible to be honest. Like I did design at school as well. So I had some sort of formal education with, with to be honest, very good like industry experts as well were, were helping. And I mean, even within that, you know, I think you need to be interested as well. That Like there were people in my class that just, couldn't do it or weren't mm -hmm. interested and didn't do it but I think there are ways to do it but I, I also agree you, you might need a, a personality trait or there might need to be something in you to enable you to do that and again I'm not saying like you know I still have probably more realistic design approach than the majority of designers would but um, <laughs> the reason is and the reason why You know, you were saying I, I've tried it and I've struggled and it's exhausting, all of that sort of stuff. The the flip side, and that's partly where why I knew what I wanted to do was was this idea of the flow state. I don't know if you've yeah, heard of that sure. before. And like I have that to the T. You know, I can be what I used to do in my old job, I used to be cadding all day, every day, and then I'd stop, get home, and then start cadding on my own stuff. And I would lose the hours, you know, I'd, wait, I'd, I'd be cadding away and then all of a sudden it's two or three in the morning. I think, oh my God, like, where's that time gone? That's amazing. But the whole time, you know, I'm there, I'm, sol I'm like solving different problems. I'm, I've got three or four concepts that I'm there cadding up. You know, it, everything's going on a million miles an hour and I have no recollection. You know, it's like driving home from work. You don't, you don't remember how you got home. Mm. Like, it's all passive. And funnily enough, I actually, 
was speaking to one of my mates and I didn't I didn't know her that well to be honest but she she asked me because she was going through what she wanted to do with her life and she was a creative as well and I said like what do you want and she said well the way I look at it is what makes you forget about time and I thought that was quite a nice little way to approach you know a, ma a massive decision whether you continue your career or go somewhere else is what makes you forget about time and that for me is is like is design basically and I'm still trying to chase it with work I you know I still have a hugely well I'm, I'm still hugely influenced by the engineering side of stuff with what I do not to get too deep into it but I really um, I'm chasing that a lot I think it's it's a very good reward system to be in the zone to like get in the zone not to get distracted yeah yeah I'm a very distracted person like all the the blings on my phone really um <laughs> take me off yeah. that state but when I have like the day is just better like when I feel like I have been some sort of different dimension for the past three four hours yeah like I, I that's a good way to put it like the way you she she put it um, yeah what makes you forget about time what okay because also you, you won't realize as well that what like the capacity you're probably using as much of your brain capacity as you would in any other situation in that flow state because there's nothing there to to distract you you can fully plug in and 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 take it to another level and i'm sure the work you do in that flow state as well is unrivaled yeah, yeah, yeah it's the best i was maybe some of my questions were also towards um for example if i picked like when i like i'm very logical and like oh well if there's something i need to learn i find a book about it right like i'll read about it and i read product design books logo yeah. design books and they're just really bad i found the quality is just lacking and where they it's designed by perfect like best brands you should ask the guys who have designed the best brands right like yeah. but none of these professors have done that like it's like learning business from broke professors like yeah, why would yeah. you do that do you think that's the case where you can't you should learn um try to learn Uh, product design from um, you you cannot learn it through logic right you can learn it through observing other successful brands and trying to copy like maybe observing human patterns and behaviors you can't read it off of a book like for I see example I also like I mean first page you open it's it's like oh McDonald's and Nike like yeah. look at McDonald's art you're like and yeah that's super primitive like yeah like, what what about the Nike there's nothing about this that I can learn from it's just the, the probably the design of the logo itself was like stellar coincidence yeah. like cosmic coincidence <coughs> and then over decades many many decades of hard work marketing like improving the quality like talking to customers and like you can't say that the tick makes it Nike you know yeah. like That's what I'm really struggling with when I read these product design books where it's like, oh, well, you recognize, you recognize Apple, the Apple logo? And it's like, yeah, I do. What about it? Like, teach me something I don't know. How do you, I'm asking you, how would you learn it? Like, let's say I'm someone who doesn't have that. Yeah. Like, what would actually, the question would be, where do you start? What, what do you, what, what's your thought process? Like, are you... Thinking as in as in mine or what someone because again everyone is different you know mm. some some people need to learn from a book I, I can't do that but also some things like as you said logo design you know if you said go design a logo and someone came back and gave you a tick let's say Nike started today and they and they sent it out to logo designers and they came back with a tick they'd be like what is this that's exactly what I'm thinking about like it's like so that's that's and I I think we spoke about it before like every single logo has developed over time mm. every single logo you know you look at starbucks you look at pepsi coke all of these things they start with something and as the brand develops and as the perception of customer the customer perception develops you can start to edit and get the logo you want when you were when you were every day in front of the black uh, piece of paper like what is what is the immediate thing like what do i need so, to create yeah here? so what in terms of that then it it all boils down to if you're looking at a systematic way to learn how to design you need to identify what the problem is so in this case the problem i have is that i want to create a brand and well that's the sort of wider image is that i'm developing a brand the problem i have is that i want a logo to represent the brand 
So that's the problem statement there. You then look at your requirements, your user needs, you, 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 your wants and needs basically. And that can be material that could be it's maybe slightly more difficult with a logo because it's not tangible but you know if we're designing the table you need to identify who's going to use it where it's going to be used what materials need to be used how much it needs to be what the finish needs to be you know all, all of these things need to come into it if it's if it's in a an asian company the anth uh, uh, an asian country sorry the anthropometric data is different you know um do you want it to be an ergonomic chair or a table do you want it to fit a range of products in your catalog or do you want it to be a standalone feature you know there are so many considerations you need to have and that at the start of a program in or a product creation you need to define that boundary mm, that's quite a lot um and there's there are so many you know and again this is the case of no one really gets it right to start with it's all a development and improvement over time and you know we're going to see that with what we do you know it, there's a reason you iterate everything no one has ever designed one product at, at, like in the prototype phase and it's right mm. everything has to develop over time so in terms of yeah learning learning how to design i don't really know because i've actually never been taught formally well i have but not to you know master's level or um, further education but that's not to say and people will disagree with me as well and, and again it's case by case but there will be people that you can bring off the street and could do a perfectly good job at designing a table or a chair or yeah. something different and they might have a completely different approach you know there's no right or wrong answer and that's why everything comes out differently you know that's why the the sort of dream state or the archetype design is is the chair you know everyone wants to have a, a an iconic chair designed and the ones that are iconic are so different to each other you know if you put them in a room together a lot of them you wouldn't even think are a chair and I'm certain everyone would have designed it differently. Their approach would have been different. It would have taken a different amount of time. They might have had a group with them. You know, the processes are different. The wants and needs are different. The use cases are completely different. For me, it might be comfortable. For you, it'd be terrible. You know, it's such a, it's such a fluid discipline that it's not like maths where you learn how to do quadratic equations and there is a right way and a wrong way and you get an answer at the end and I think some people struggle with that as well for me I love that I love the idea that you can you know there are a million cars to buy in the world that are different and you can go and find the one that suits you that that for me is amazing same with clothing same with same with music same with everything so I think if you if you open yourself up to that sort of the, the fact that everything is going to be different or there's variety then that's probably the starting point i would say mm. that, that that's that's not a bad reply like i think there's a lot to it and obviously there isn't an easy answer to this but i get what you're saying let's i, I also want to mention something you brought up before it's the eternal struggle between mechanic like the the logical and the what was it, artistic i guess um what is obviously the the engineer versus the designer and i mean some companies uh, like a notorious i'm not going to mention who they are but they basically they have design departments and then they have the like the concept you come up with the concept and then there are the poor people who are like trying, trying to, to realize to it. realize it and there is always conflict because <laughs> like you then there is some disdain between people and it's like well like i it took me 10 years to learn how to like make these circuits you on a whim decided they're this shape you don't know what you're doing like you're basically you are uh, like i am in this world and you are like a make-believe world right? right like that's what an engineer would say so what like have you 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 you're probably in a good position because you are i've been on both sides of you've the been on both sides yeah. do you think what do you have you experienced that like we've designed something that cannot be made yeah. um or and the flip side is um, let's say the the mechanical guy like the, let's say the engineers are just not uh, seeing the vision right have you have you experienced that I have at different levels as well so like from a personal level I have and I think to answer your question I think there is huge benefit in 
may be different in a professional environment where you have like time and money constraints and all of that and the deadline to meet and but if you don't challenge and push because effectively there's going to be a trade-off you're never going to achieve what you want you know if we want a flying car and we design a flying car to realize it we we might have to you know de-scope it over time but if we if we start with instead of saying what am i trying to say here if you don't aim for the the stars you know you're going to produce another car you need to you need to challenge it and in the way in, in the middle you know things like concord for example concord jumped so far ahead in terms of what they wanted to, to achieve um real struggle huge engineering effort but by by jumping to the stage they didn't achieve everything they wanted but they accelerated the development of so many things like the technology used in that was so far ahead of its time and that's the only way it would have been able to do that by challenging it and i think you know again i i appreciate both sides and i appreciate it's a pain if as you said it takes 10 years to design a method of well of circuitry or um that sort of concept and then someone that has no idea of how things work in that in that field so like actually an, we should do it like an this. upper hand on you yeah exactly right. and again it depends on you know where we're working now there is a different emphasis on or the trade-off between design and engineering it's different to other places that i've been before and again there's no right or wrong answer and you know for example with things i've found that some of the trade-offs will come naturally so for example if i if i design a concept and i prototype it or let's say i 3d print it which is really really a common thing to do that i do you can see immediately where things don't work or work and let's say you want a perfect finish or a, a really geometric curve and a, basically an unusual condition and you then try and realize it and it doesn't work you know as a fact then oh, we need to make improvements, we need to iterate it. But in doing so, you, you're maybe going to lose some of the the surface shape. You're going to have to simplify it slightly. But if you started with the simple shape, you probably never would be happy with what you created. And that's what I found at a more personal level. So, you know, less investment in time, money and other people. But my approach to it is to, to aim as high as you can. Mm and then work your way down you're saying it's like it's it's necessary that thing that, that so. conflict is necessary for you to come up with the best thing otherwise you know i'm trying to find a good example but whereas i guess conflict is a rough word like balance it's yeah it's, like it's, if you it's, if it's, i exactly word it balance. differently like it's not conflict between two teams it's like a, it's a target for you to reach the balance between them right That would, that would sound better but every everything's different as well you know like designing a bottle and designing a vehicle you know the trade-offs are going to be different so that again there's no one size fits all it shouldn't be a case of you know the designers have four weeks to come up with an idea and then engineering have 12 weeks on this product but then on the next product engine the engineering team have 15 weeks and design have one week it doesn't really work like that and what i'm trying to say really is that the concern i have is if you if you desimplify well if you simplify it too much and you go with what you know and what what works in the past you end up with the same product over 50 years and again i get i get the struggle i get the conflict but you need people to push the boundary because naturally it will come back to a middle right, point right. but if you aim higher the middle point is going to be above where you are at the moment so, what about your yeah. position like uh, what about um you being an engineer maybe it was a uh, like that mistake that you made at university level maybe it's a gift that you are exactly. an engineer potentially like, yeah why would those companies not see like they say oh well you're an engineer we don't want to hire you isn't that also so, like there, there will be companies that seek out product designers that are engineers because yeah, they're already like the, in the middle automotive is a good example of that as well there are roles where you are sort of the middleman between the two and there is definite value in it as well but it doesn't remove the conflict hmm. no i think it, it makes it easier it makes right? it easier because if the conflict happens within one person right you within, basically you avoid the grenade being thrown over the fence basically because you're the one at the you're the one on the on the fence on opening. Both sides, yeah yeah, yeah. This
is the XOR. The fact that you did a sport, first of all, did that improve hundred percent your well being, yeah. right? Yeah. Did you did you feel like it pushed you to try even harder because you're busier than everyone? Like you had to like you had to be switched on all like you had more at stake, you had more to do. So you going to lectures were kind of uh, you would try harder would you do you think Potentially. i mean I, I work very hard all the time to be fair um and to be honest it was just routine because i used to train at home anyway when i was at before i went to uni and work really really hard i think when i went to uni i think the benefit of it not just for well-being and the fact i i loved judo so so much was that i always felt you know the first thing i was told when i met my tutor was you're not gonna have time to do anything you're, you're here to do engineering get a degree and go mm. and that wasn't my approach at all you know uni for me was to experience life have as much fun as i could do as many sports as i could in an amazing facility meet new people and and get a degree as well you know obviously the splits are different but the fact i was doing judo so often as well as an engineering degree i always felt like i was sort of cheating i always felt like i was doing what I was told I couldn't do, but I was on top of it. Right. And that yeah. used to give me this feeling that I couldn't I can, describe. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, and sure. also, you know, for me, the fact I could, I could train and be absolutely knackered, so physically tired, and then go plonk myself down and start working. Again, really unique feeling, but it helped me. And the I grind, lost, right? I like, lost, exactly. And I lost all of that quite, quite quickly. And on top of it, just the struggle of like, Injury, having having right. one arm for 12 weeks and having to stay late at uni or a couple of weeks into this, the the holidays because I needed to catch up on work. And, you know, all of that sort of stuff added to it. Do you think it's some, like, I have a weird the thing with sports also, martial arts in particular, that it gives you sort of another sort of brains. Like, it, it's, it's a different, different discipline. Isn't it's it? a different, like, someone who's... Like I've done wrestling, I've done jujitsu, I've done other sports, and I feel like if I didn't do them, I wouldn't be the person or the engineer. Like it, it, it's the culture that really affects your mind state. And if you are a bit of like you, like I was never at a level that you were, like you were at a very high level athlete and also an engineer. Like, how did you think one affected the other? Do you do you think? Do you think that it, it, it at all did that when you're? To be honest, I I think um, I I wasn't at the level it, it, for it to be enough of a um, a challenge. To be honest, you know, engineering. My work was I never had trouble choosing between the two. If that makes mm. sense, because I wasn't I wasn't traveling abroad every week to fight. I wasn't at that the level right. above where it's you know. The guys I was training with there were training three times a day, every day, and then on the weekends they were driving in their Renault Clio with a rice cooker in the back, sleeping in it to fight in Finland for a night and then driving back. You know, I didn't have that grind, that level of grind at all. Oh. Um, but I agree with you, the mind state is completely different and whether I know it or not, I've like, it, judo, I started judo when I was three. So without question, you know, I can't think of a time when I wasn't doing judo it's basically like walking you know it's crazy um and it doesn't it does impact you like it affects you and i think really really positively as well that culture that mindset of for me the main thing and i thought about this recently actually was was you were very quickly humbled in judo a lot of the time oh yeah um that's it, exactly what i mean like discipline humbleness hard work, perseverance, hard work, as hard well. work like those things they they can be developed out of other things but having the taste of that in martial arts and sport in general makes you a different person H like sport you, you is so be, important you me. would be at a disadvantage if you've never done sports you've never had to go through that like all right let's say martial arts being like um having some ego issues maybe like that would cleanse you of that that would make you a different person 100 percent. and i think for me one of the things I, I think probably learned the most is you get put in unique situations in these disciplines that you wouldn't elsewhere and, and you learn things about yourself as a result. So I used to do all nighters for every assignment I did, always. And that level of stress and like 
nervousness and all of those horrible feelings, anxiety, all of that, I had experience at a slightly different. Mm. It like, doesn't compare. It, it right? doesn't when you compare, go to a competition, when, when like, yeah, like prepare for honestly preparing to fight in a competition, especially when I was younger, it was the most nerve wracking thing ever. You're there. You're trying to make weight to start with, so you're not really eating. You're you're nervous. You're constantly going to the toilet. That's like that's one thing and then you have hours sat down iron up who you're potentially fighting you see people getting hurt you see people are very aggressive um you know it's a really unique thing to experience but then you learn from it and it's something you then start to crave when you're older you know um fight fighting day when i was older was like the best thing ever Oh, making weight challenge number one done I'm there number two who are we fighting I can't wait I hope it's him I hope it's him um, and I think part of the reason judo and these sports are so good is because they're so difficult these things are so so hard they're, you put so much of yourself at stake you get hurt all the time you know everyone is injured that's competing everyone will have a dislocated shoulder or a broken leg or their fingers and toes will be broken but it encourages you and it sort of it enables you to go above and beyond what you think was possible and again you don't appreciate it while you're there it's when you think about it after where things that should in theory be a lot more difficult a lot more challenging you have had experiences not directly or in not the same but maybe the same level of stress or you know it's just about being put in different environments and learning different things and, and judo for me was like it's such a unique thing same in martial arts and then as you said the element of like being humbled or um, maybe having issues with the ego and, and all of that it it's such a, a heavily dense discipline and, and culture that like it's an education as well as, as a sport mm. and one of the things that I always th thought because I'm like I've, I love football as well I'm really really passionate about football but it was never, the, never quite the same. And I think part of the reason was I knew as soon as I was getting ready to, to do judo or walk into the, the, to the dojo that I'd have to be full on. Like you could never train half-heartedly because physically you're being thrown. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas like, if, if I'm not feeling great and I went to play football, you know, I could not make that run or I could, you know, right, miss right, that right. tackle. You can sort of You're scale under it down. You're constant threat. Like, yeah, it's right, like zero, 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 all the time. zero, 100, basically. Um, and again, like, <laughs> I probably don't appreciate it as much as I as I should, but, but partly because I, ha like, it, it, my career Do you think all kids ended? should um, have, like, physical education like that? Like, do you think you wouldn't be the man you are today, like, or even a product designer without those experiences? Um, like let's say you're stressed under yeah. like a team like your manager stressing you out let's say you would say well this is nothing I've had you know heavyweights in front of me trying to like drop me on my head like this is nothing right? yeah probably so, and like, without knowing basically like as I said before it's not it's not a direct replacement or I've experienced that stress before mm -hmm. in a working environment you experience it in a different environment but your body knows how to react to it you know how to deal with so yeah absolutely like would you would you get your kids into that i'd love to yeah and i i think what do you think you did wrong though did you think you did anything wrong like maybe not start at three maybe start at 10 i don't know because also like i think judo there is maybe a lack of awareness about it as well judo is um like we went to a family club and it was an amazing environment to, to learn how to do judo it wasn't like you weren't thrown into competition and had to sink or swim it wasn't that sort of place mm. um, I think the only thing actually if I could go back and do it differently was to I'd ramp up where I wanted to get to I would have been trying to push for GB like way earlier and maybe take it more seriously but then again you know I had an amazing life growing up I was playing football in the park all the time and um, like I really enjoyed school I would have lost a lot of that if I was to go full time that early so it's impossible to know really but I would definitely get my kids into it <laughs> yeah 100% I think it's funny actually that my my old design director he was um he was like a bodybuilder and he said 
that discipline you had in, in training and like working harder than you thought you ever could and working harder than the next person is what took him to the level he's at with design and when he was presenting it, I was like yeah I completely understand that you know it's like again these aren't the same discipline it's really difficult to for people that haven't done them before it might be difficult for them to appreciate why one helps with the other but they do mm. it's like a I assume I, well I suppose because you're the medium you're in the middle between the two effectively it's an impact it has on you that you can then go and apply to other disciplines right, right, right. so but yeah it's an interesting one martial arts this is the XOR well to start with like it might be obviously people have their opinions but I feel very very Brazilian like I feel like there are so many sides of it that I I love and like feel really deep connection to the way I see Brazilians they're a very warm people you know you go over there no matter if they have nothing if they have everything they are very very happy people it could be the sun it could be the weather but you know they appreciate things like that the food they love dancing carefree they want to have fun they look for the fun and everything and you know that for me is like that's what life is about is like looking for the fun in things and being happy so that's the way I see Brazil obviously you know it's, a, it's there's also danger and it's a massive country there's loads of people hugely diverse there are major major deep rooted problems there as well but my my opinion of them is really really positive maybe again because I didn't grow up there so that you know I, I've had my Brazilian mates that are near my age is like completely black or white where some of them have left Brazil well loads of them that end up in London they leave Brazil because they get to the point where they despise everything about it and they just have to to get out really what, how come um, well the deep rooted issues the poverty the corruption you know right, right. There, there are the list goes on but on the flip side and it, it seems to be again it could just be my friends but the ones that left quite early so when they were sort of teenagers they longed to go back to Brazil mm. they see the positive side of it again so I think similar to the designer engineer you have like one who's in dream state that they see Brazil as just like incredible can't go wrong you want the sun you want the people you want the vibe back and then the others will see it more negatively and look look for the bad rather than the good but it tends to be completely black or white but um, yeah it's one of those that my my mates used to say it like obviously I don't look Brazilian at all but the more they get to know me they sort of see signs of it like it drops in and out right, right, right. Um, and that's interesting obviously I can't tell because <laughs> I, I can't look on the outside looking in but yeah it's something I'm like I'm really proud to be half Brazilian as well hmm. and you know one of the things I always think about what, what I can do and what I want for my kids and all of that sort of stuff and that's something I really want to be able to pass on to them is that that side of the culture that, that side they of have that, that heritage, attitude and, right? yeah and it's it's funny you mentioned the culture thing because I read a book a long time ago I don't read a lot but um, they all tend to be asking like the wider questions and one of them was the one thing that survives everything evolution um, disaster is culture like culture is indestructible so for example you know like what's going on at the moment the Ukrainian culture is always going to be there and if anything it gets stronger and stronger each day in destruction and that is such an amazing thing like again it's this intangible thing that develops over time it it, it evolves it, it doesn't get it doesn't get robbed by evolution it actually gets strengthened by it and yeah I think fortunately the culture of Brazil is fantastic and I feel like that culture is within me, even if it's just a slither, even if it's just half. Do you think uh, also, I mean, it, it, do you feel like there is also the mixture of Brazilian and British? Like, <laughs> wouldn't that be the polar opposite? Like, don't, yeah. don't you think? Yeah, 100%. Like, they are, like, British people are more somber and, like, um, reclusive. They, they 
have the opposite weather they have the opposite <laughs> climate they have uh, i mean yeah it's, it's the complete opposite like how like if you were let's say uh, peruvian brazilian like you're not far off right but being like eastern and western at the same time like how do you think that is like do you have conflicts at home where like you just can't well like, like, how, how does that work like how does that work i mean for example like dad not learning portuguese is the most british thing ever <laughs> it's like yeah of course there are conflicts um but again you know like i i'm i'm in that fortunate position where i can sort of pick and choose what i want right, both. Right. and there is there is good in british there's also I I quite I view it fairly negatively to be fair, um, because it's so negative. Like, I think people are needlessly um, self degrading, and there's a lot of the small talk thing that we talked about. Like, you know, how's mm. the weather? All of that sort of stuff. It's whereas like it could be a religious thing as well. You know, in Brazil, everything is. <laughs> there seems to be more hope over there whether it's because it, religion is so much more important over there than, than here and faith and mean? faith and yeah well I mean <clears throat> like people pray a lot right people pray you know everything's like, oh thank god it's a beautiful day or you know I mean you have what and like the, like, the statue of Jesus like, yeah exactly you know like this, the sort of iconic parts of Brazil there are huge roots with religion you know even football for example football can be seen as religion it is over there it gives people hope it's that like that idea that yeah effectively it's that I think I think it, there are more there are more ways of um, generating hope in Brazilian culture than there are in British culture and I think that hope is what gives people their outlook on life the positivity they might have little but their quality of life people seem to be a lot happier um, which is incredible when you then come home like you see the poverty on the streets and you know we were there it was like 45 degrees there are people sleeping outside and you think my god and you come back and then people are complaining here and you think mm. it's that sort of perspective that maybe people are less travelled here as well you know they're, they're, these are like really deep rooted issues for both sides but the existence of religion in Brazil being so strong it like kind of pushes people on right like that, that I think so. tell me other things like that's very good like what are the other things that are so innately brazilian that like resonates like it bleeds into other things like let's say well music is one music samba music are they more in touch with music than absolutely you, you know people go up dancing and you know here it's like you know the drunken dad at the party or yeah gum fingers you know <laughs> do you know what i mean it's a different vibe completely you know if you go out in brazil you're weird if you don't dance are you, would you say they are more like you they are happier but are they more positive in when it comes to struggle so would you say um would you agree with that first of all it's difficult for me to say because obviously i've been fortunate enough to not be in the struggle over there but from the outside looking in it does seem like that mm do you think you have that attitude basically uh you are more of a brighter like happier person being brazilian like it almost like uh some sort of internal like I, I, I think so yeah like, i i feel that really deeply as well to be fair i think that's where i side most with my brazilian side is that like outlook on life so so you don't know where it comes from like you you basically say there are some of it is to do with the I'm climate sure, yeah I'm sure it's a mixture of everything to be honest I do think religion as well is like I've seen again whether you take it from me or not but I've seen very positive things with religion over there like it gives people hope when they have absolutely nothing are you religious? I am religious yeah like to, to which point? to which degree? Um, that's it yeah that's another deep rooted question as well to be fair but I yeah I'm religious I pray every day I again I don't know whether it's from you know I went to a Catholic school here primary school but no one there was really Catholic like my two brothers went to the same school with me they're not religious at all mm. and they're both half Brazilian technically so like I don't know where it comes from for me but you take time off your day like in the morning or morning and night yeah but you know it doesn't have to be like Again, I, I, like, oh, my, my yeah, see, it's like systematic, like oh, yeah, in the yeah. morning, no, in the yeah. afternoon. I think my, like my, I think 
again this is a controversial one but it's the way I my, like my connection with religion is open to my interpretation so it's my own interpretation of what religion is and what it's been for me hmm. it might be something completely different for other people but what I see when I go to Brazil and, and the, the, the language they use you know when you say bye to someone it's vai com Deus it's like go with God you know it, that's like that's natural to say over there imagine saying that here when you say bye to your mates go with God my friend it's like yeah, take, take do you know what face, I mean that's yeah. where like that's mm. that's the, <laughs> on the topic of the Brazilian versus English like that is the yeah. this is the XOR you mentioned like what are you researching and what are you interested in what, one of the things I've been looking at is well going back to this brand I have the, the push for what I do with that is is concept generation rather than like product stuff and what I mean by that is a concept to me is like a, a, a direction it's it's you know there's an analogy of a, a huge ship and you have a hundred rudders underneath or whatever they're called the thing the paddles to, to steer and you I'm the captain and I I'm trying to change the direction so I'm trying to create a concept and my job then is to define the concept and I need to convince the majority so 51 people or 51 rudders to go in the direction that I want to go in and what I've been focused on in particular was was fast fashion so fast fashion being the the rapid buy and well people buying clothes consistently and then throwing them away mm. And obviously the the resource drain and you know all of the socioeconomic factors that you get with it, and all gets dumped. Uh, it, exactly, and it's again looking at the wider issue. So one one of the things I was looking at was concepts to get people thinking about what what can be done. And one of the and again it it, it comes down from issues I've made. Like we all have probably ten or twenty white and black t-shirts with a tiny little logo on exactly what are you trying to say um and <laughs> i purposely came in all in white here um but yeah we can have 10 exactly well identical white t-shirts with the same tiny logo and we all fall for it we all buy 10 exactly the same but with a different logo and what i'm trying to what i'm trying to get at with the stuff i design is like trying to understand why we do that and what we can do to prevent it so one of the things i was looking at as a concept was like removable or detachable logos so the idea being or the concept behind it but instead of buying 10 white tops with 10 different logos you buy the logo mm. and again it boils down what are you actually after are people after the shirt because it's a white shirt and it's good cut and good quality or are they after the little logo on it most people are after the logo i know i was when i was buying this stuff so i all of a sudden i then look at can we convince brands to sell their logo instead of selling products and try and see the benefits of it again the logistics i haven't looked at or not into depth but again because i'm looking at concepts rather than an end product i'm just looking at a direction to get people to think about so a lot of the stuff i've been doing this year and i wear it to work as well i'll buy a white top and a black top and i'll 3d print the logos and all of a sudden i have for one what it takes to make one white top and also to wash it helps with washing and the complete cycle of the product i can have let's say these are all my logos i can walk in tomorrow and be like today i'm wearing nike mm. and put it on and on top of that it's not just the fact that i have a detachable logo i can then transform whatever asset i'm wearing so I can move the logo here today or tomorrow I can have it central or the day after I can have it on my sleeve. You know, you open up flexibility that you don't have initially. And again, these aren't necessarily good ideas, but it's, a th it's the thought. It's trying to get people to think about what they're actually trying to, trying to achieve or what they wear and no, that makes perfect sense. how they do it. Um, so I've always looked at that equivalent in other industries, like questioning why people do it. Because we all do a lot of the, you know, we all fall for the same trap. Try, I'm trying to think of other things that I've done without giving away my ideas. But <laughs> yeah, because, you know, that one, that's almost, it's not a non-starter, but it requires, you know, the, the idea initially came from, 
I did a study when I was like 16 about l looking at the, the wide use cases of 3D printers. So this was when they weren't really a, a thing. Mm. But I was sort of mapping what the traditional printers, their growth based on how expensive they were and within sort of 10, 20 years, everyone had one in their house. I looked at Christmas presents, like what, what you could get from, would families in future not buy Christmas presents? Would they just print it the night before? You know, that was the sort of approach I was looking at. And what this then led on to was instead of, again, with this, the environmental impact, do, do brands need to actually make tangible products all the time? And obviously the NFTs have kicked off as well, but can we convince brands to sell models of their logo that I can then print at home without having to drive to the store, pay for delivery? Um, but then they lose some of their control. You know, again, this is like, this is what I'm saying about concept. It's just getting people thinking. It's a new direction in 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 our behavior. So I've always loved that that thought and I've always tried to see other people doing that. And obviously like where we work as well, that was one of the major pools. It was like questioning what people do, why we're doing it now. Hmm. But um yeah, I'm trying to think. There are loads of other little... Um, oh, yeah, so that, that Croc Nike thing I was telling you about. It was looking at looking at products for what they are. So the Croc is effectively a, like an injection-molded main shoe. And then the there's, a, there's a... Oh, yeah, there's like... Yeah, the, the, the main body is a one-piece injection-molded rubber. And then there's the clip at the top. And... Combining that with collaboration, I thought, you know, the main area of failure with the croc and like Avayana sandals or whatever is, is, is the strap at the back. Do people ever, once that breaks, do they replace it or do they buy new shoes? I usually just went and bought new shoes. In addition to that, can we, can we combine brand collaboration? So I looked at the croc Nike and I effectively removed the strap from the croc and I, I designed the, the strap to be the shape of the tick and it would follow, mm. if that makes sense. So the silhouette would be the tick from one side and then the strap would go around the other and you'd have the inverse tick on the other side. So, so the strap itself was a Nike logo. Exactly. So all of a sudden you have, in essence, two shoes now without having to buy two pairs of shoes. But also that would make you value the strap more exactly. because the strap itself has value, not just holding a shoe, uh, holding a leg, but... It's, it's a branded piece of it, Exactly. Plastic. So it, it's that wider question, which design can do, you know, like you can, you can answer, well, if you question what you're, what you're doing, I question it now. Like when I look at, am I actually, do I go into a shop and go, that, that jacket looks amazing? Or do I walk up to it and go, oh, it's, it's a hundred quid and it's Tommy Hilfiger or mm. Gucci or whatever. I now question that before I didn't I'd be like yeah it's Gucci I'll buy it <laughs> but do you know what I mean it's like yeah. not saying that I buy Gucci but that it's that mindset um, and I I'm aware that I, I've sort of veered from your question but <laughs> yeah in terms of <laughs> the most amazing thing I've seen is you know I got I actually got caught off guard by this in a in an interview once I I applied for this brand in America and I was, yeah, the interview was like a proper wake up call. And one of the things they asked right at the end was, what, what's the best piece of design you've ever seen? But, yeah. yeah. And, and he said, oh, my, mine is a ring pool. So do you know the, the things on cans? And, mm, yeah. And the interview were, yeah, said, yeah, he said, his is the ring pool. Um, and he didn't give a description for it. And two things really firstly I hadn't thought about what the best thing I'd ever seen was and secondly I was trying to figure out why the ring pool was the best bit of design and then I hate those because I can never get my nail under it so I then looked online and it's <laughs> I can't remember actually the reason to the top of my head but it effectively transformed the drinks industry because before you couldn't you couldn't buy or take products with you they had to be they couldn't store like carbonized drinks for example that were easily accessible they saved x number of well kilos of material and pounds to the consumer like all with this tiny little feature of a bit of a of a product so that sort of made sense to me but at the time 
bit on the way there I was reading a magazine and there was a someone had won an award for tackling pollution in London so again like the same sort of approach I'd have there was when when the pollution in London hit the record yeah, what, record air levels pollution or what air pollution right. um, they looked at the main contributors and like obviously transport was like the main and then you had um, household and electricity and what that what not and then one of them was like commuters or like basically p- pedestrians um, and what they did they, they highlighted because they knew that most people were tackling the transport and the, the housing market or the household areas they tackled pedestrians and what they did was look at common use cases what what did they do every day and they basically isolated the fact that everyone wears shoes <laughs> and they redesigned the sole of the shoe to have like hundreds of bubbles and each bubble had a tiny little hole through where, where the air could get in and out and within those bubbles there were filters and basically what you would do as you walked you would sort of suck in air and then as you as your foot compressed it would pass through the filters and then when you release the air would be released but clean and I was and again you know practically is probably they, they proved that it worked I don't know how efficient but n- and no one would really buy it but I was like that's an amazing concept and I told the guy and he was like yeah that's not what I was after oh, all right. <laughs> but, um, so yeah I've got a bit of a haunting haunting feeling with that question but I do want to answer that because mm. there are there are times and usually to be honest I write stuff down when I think it's a good idea or I see it yeah. so I'm sure there is something on there's a thing called Kaziri which is like a again I, I'm not an expert and I don't know too much about it but it's like a dye process with fabric in Japan and I think you can either weave in dyed fabric or you have a fabric to start with and you dye it by hand and the idea is when you well basically what happens when you drop ink on a fab on fabric the ink will seep so it will never really go where you want it to and the the analogy this guy was having this guy well the book that i read was that it's it's a very wide or common like manufacturing method in japan or was traditionally and you, you you create very beautiful patterns but they always will have the frayed sides where the ink seeps slightly Mm-hmm. so if I dropped ink on here you know you, do you understand what I'm trying to say okay yeah. there'll um, be an imperfection in the way imperfection you're trying and, to colour this t-shirt and basically what he, what he said there was a king or again I probably should have known the story a bit better but there was a king who ordered he collected all of the best Kazuri dyes in the country to produce the most perfect scar for him and what they did was effectively artificially remove the bleed of ink Mm. and what happened is that the outcome was actually not as nice and when I read it he basically said um, and what I wrote here was that so Kaziri is the idea that something produced naturally that leads to the blurring it has more beauty and then artificially creating something that doesn't have the blur and what he said with it is like it's analogous to living and going against your gut feeling so trying to perfect things that aren't how you feel or don't go with it within the natural f- like forces of life well the, the way they forced ink it, it's like exactly. the way they force you, you actually remove and again like you know he's talking about ink and on fabric but relating it to the wider issues and he said here this is the quote he was like there's beauty in in the natural and there's beauty in following what the universe wants and funnily enough like that's partly why i'm quite carefree as well like you know I don't feel significant enough to care to the level that people do Mm. you know there's so much going on what is it called Kazooie Kazooie that's a good one and he says yeah it's the unavoidable outcome of natural forces and again I was like that stuff like that blows my mind that's exactly what like maybe I should be um, like (laughs) have them in the back of my head to ask people well, that's um, the thing. There's there's so many like again. This is all specific to design, just because it's my interest. But there there are things here about like um, one of the things that used to really annoy people I worked with is like striving for for perfection with design because in theory, like it's ne- you're never going to be happy if you you are if you are a perfectionist. You know, you're never quite happy. But 
there is there's no harm in cha- challenging it or striving for it because you're never going to reach it as long as you have that reality because or that understanding because you know like evolution robs robs people of of perfection things will always happen naturally that are going to be better similar to this podcast man see you next time on the xor